We're going to see if I can actually say this. Kunta verthlitze si itere was la hio forferda. Now repeat after me. Guten Tag, Sigrid. Nippon Atomichen. Today we're watching Season 8, Episode 2, The Leech Woman. A movie about a well-respected lady physician during the Black Plague. But first, follow-up. Lots of it. Indeed. Uh, so our last episode was The Revenge of the Creature. And I know you're a big fan of the Creature trilogy. So do you have anything about that particular situation? Yes, a few things, I guess, in order. One, <laughs> Creature from the Black Lagoon is very good. And I would totally recommend watching it for the aforementioned redesign or original design of the creature and he has a, an amazing moment when he's first on screen you don't even see the full creature you just see the hand and the hand is so big it envelops a guy's entire face <laughs> for the first murder that style uh the first two creature movies including revenge of the creature that we watched last time w they were directed by jack arnold and Jack Arnold, as it turns out, is uh, something of a gill man in the ways of love himself, <laughs> with no excuses of being an Amazonian creature out of time and out of place. Yeah, I, I, it's hard not to feel like a lot of these movies are just, it's just a lot of projection going on. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it definitely is with Jack Arnold, because what I found out specifically in regards to Revenge of the Creature is that he apparently had the reputation of, and I quote, being one of Universal's resident wolves. Mm -hmm. always hitting on actresses and whatnot and the actress who played dr uh what was her name <laughs> <laughs> Rhonda. there we go so uh the actress who played dr leslie she had found that her uh, like accommodations it was arranged so that jack arnold had the keys to her room uh. and that their rooms were close together so what the actress did is that she confided in her hairdresser who was working with her on the film to basically always be there so that Jack Arnold could at no point walk in. And eventually he just gave up. <sighs> yep. Nothing scares a wolf quite like one other lady. I find that really interesting because that is an example of how these quiet gossip networks, as they're kind of derogatorily called of women keep each other safe because there's no other way of doing it officially. And the fact that there's a record of it from that far back is really interesting yeah had the had the me too movement been around in the 50s jack arnold probably would have been the first to go but lastly he didn't work on the final movie in the trilogy and i watched it right before we recorded and it's probably the most depressing one <laughs> it's notable in that it stars both rex reason and uh jeff morrow from this island earth like this island earth the main guy yeah yeah and so oh, okay. it stars um Cal, and it stars uh, the guy with the giant head, Exeter. Mm. Wow. And yeah, they're uh, they're doing experiments on Gill Man. They remove his gills after, again, stunning him with dynamite. <laughs> and they find that basically Gill Man can breathe in sea and on land because he also has like these barely developed lungs. Mm. And so they kind of removed some things. They're really just simplifying his makeup so that he's even cheaper looking, basically. Like he's wearing a coat throughout the entire thing. And uh, yeah, he's uh, he's neither fish nor man. So he's very confused. He has mixed feelings for a lady again. And he just wants to go back into the ocean, which people keep pulling him out of. The movie ends with him wandering away from the mad scientist lab and walking back into the ocean while the film fades to black. So basically, the entire trilogy ends with Creature, a victim of science, committing suicide. Wow. So it's it's uh, missing that Jack Arnold lusty bonhomie, huh? Yeah. they. Uh, I, I think that's why there's so, uh, so few scenes of Creature just picking somebody up like they have <laughs> handles on them ah <laughs> uh, that is grotesque i never want to see that movie yeah it's not great and it's really depressing it's even depressing by the standards of universal monster movies of which this sadly is one indeed uh should we summarize this movie it's time on to season eight episode two the leech woman if you thought the backlash for the Ghostbusters reboot was bad, imagine what audiences thought of The Leech Woman, this gender-swapped reboot of Andy Camp. 
Our Andy Cap, that's Andy with an I, is June Talbot, a desperate woman with a face like a catcher's mitt who drowns her sorrows in booze. The flow in this Cap reboot is endocrinologist Paul Talbot, dispensing balmos instead of blows to the head. Their morning bicker is interrupted by Mala, an aged woman with a secret. First, Mala tells June that she's had prophetic dreams of blood about her. Next, she asks Paul to fund her return to Africa, where, with the help of her tribe, she can reverse the aging process. Paul refuses, but steals some of Mala's magic powder. When Dr. Talbot and his nurse Sally run some tests, they find the old woman was telling the truth. So, in the midst of divorce proceedings, Paul returns home and tells June those five simple words that could save every marriage. Baby, we're going to Nando's! They're not going to their local sandwich shop for a delicious bean, however. No, the Simpsons are going to Africa. Sorry, the Talbots are going to Africa. And with the help of their shifty guide, Garvey, they find Mala and her secretive tribe, the Nandos. The Nandos intend to kill them for disturbing their privacy, but Mala convinces the tribe to allow Garvey and the Talbots to observe her de-aging ceremony. Mala mixes the magic powder with one secret ingredient to be made young again. A dead man. More specifically, the delicious pineal gland juice contained in a man, which is extracted from the neck using a jagged ring pop. June realizes something's up when she and Paul continue bickering even while on their African vacation slash heist. Paul doesn't want to fix their marriage. He wants to use her as a guinea pig for experiments with the Nando's anti-aging powder. Mala grants June a return to her youthful looks, telling her that she can sacrifice any man to get his juice. June chooses Paul. The judges are shocked. June deages after the ritual, meaning she now looks like a 35-year-old woman instead of a 35-year-old woman with sharpie lines on her face. June and Garvey, remember him? Attack the tribe with explosives, steal the powder, and the ring pop of death. Garvey falls into quicksand and is depineeled by June. Returning to America and posing as her own niece, June begins making eyes for Neil, Nurse Sally's fiancé. Neil's instantly smitten, but she can only stay young for so long and goes on a pineal drinking spree. She kills a small-time crook with a ring pop to stay young for Neil. Her plans to have him hit a snag when Sally tries to save her impending marriage for some reason. But then Sally gets ring popped and June throws her body in the closet before her date with Neil. The date's interrupted by the cops who found June's business card on the body of the crook she killed earlier. The cops find Sally's body in the closet. June tries to show the cops why she did and presumably enter a plea of not guilty by reason of magic. When Sally's pineal juice proves ineffective, only male juice makes you young, June jumps to her death from her bedroom. Alas, poor June, she'll never drink pineal in this town again. All right, well, that was the movie. Now, on the Satellite of Love, the show opens with Crow attempting to suck up a prairie dog infestation on the Satellite of Love using a vacuum, which is a lot like the pest control used in the hit Wallace and Gromit movie, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit, which only came out two years before. Hmm. Meanwhile, Tom Zervo drives a team of cattle through the foreground. After the commercial break, Crow forgets who Mike is again, while Bobo and Dr. Peanut survey the disgusting physical degradation Mike has undergone since restarting the experiment. In segment two, Mike and the bots try to ask the nanites to help them repair the ship, but they're currently preoccupied in an increasingly violent union standoff. In segment three, Pearl's getting a spa treatment in Deep Ape, Though Bobo notes that, as a lawgiver, she hasn't been too on top of providing laws. She throws in a few. No parking on Sunday. No soup with buffet. Ah, yes it is, ape law. Now, none of this is set in stone. I'm kidding, of course. In segment four, Crow and Servo attempt to trap Mike in a pillory to harvest his pineal gland by luring him in with some of his favorite things. An Adrian Barbeau calendar, an episode of Boston Common, and a rare acoustic set from Rick James after he got back from the slammer. When that doesn't work, they try to lure in Gypsy using copies of 90s indie teen magazine, Sassy. In segment five, Tom insists on being treated as Granny from the Beverly Hillbillies so that she can scream, Jan! A lot. I think they were trying for a rake joke here, but it really doesn't work. (laughs) Now, in terms of of that particular rake joke, what do you think is better? The constant callbacks to that or the sight of Kevin Murphy in an ape suit and a diapy? Yeah, there's a reason I didn't mention that in my uh, summary. I I didn't know who Adrian Barbeau was. Oh, man, Adrian Barbeau is great. 
She's like the most 70s looking woman I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, AJ Barbeau, of course, co-star of Maud. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> As so, she was always tete-a-tete with B. Arthur. Uh, she was John Carpenter's first wife and so appeared in several of his movies. Uh, she romanced the Swamp Thing and Wes Craven's Swamp Thing. Hmm. And she was a uh, Catwoman on the 90s Batman cartoon. Oh, cool. Well, anyway, I-, I saw a picture of her like belly dancing in the background and she looked like she was having so much goddamn fun. I think I was like, okay. I think I like her. Yeah, Adrienne Barbeau. Her her hair is 70s fierce. Mm-hmm. But I saw an interview she did for uh, one of John Carpenter's movies as like a behind-the-scenes doc, and she's so genteel and nice. I love her. But yes, I guess we should go back to talking about this episode. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it, I would say that it's, it's a continuation in some ways from uh, the last episode we saw in terms of the riffing is good, but it's just kind of adjacent i feel like i'm just watching the movie and occasionally i notice that they make kind of a cute comment but they just seem more backgrounded than i'm used to i was a little less fond of the riffing for the previous episode like i really don't think revenge of the creature is a good episode but it does have weirdly engaging segments Mm -hmm. but i think the riffing here is a little better because like i can only really remember one or two jokes from the previous episode here there's a couple of good ones there's a couple of times that i laughed and several times when i winced like when the cops show up at the end of the movie and mike chimes in with we're here to represent the transgender society that was i don't even know what kind of joke he was trying to make yeah i it's it's just it 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 should have just been tossed out and then gotten a confused reaction like i'm not sure even what they're going with is just a bunch of 50s guys like middle-aged guys they look there's nothing there's no appearance to comment on so like i i honestly don't know what the joke was like it's it's like something got put in there to fill space and i guess that's something that i really dislike that comes up a lot in discussion of these last few seasons of the show versus like the earliest days from say season two and season three is that people talk about riff density as though that matters i'm almost reminded of like if you compare say, you know, seasons three and four of The Simpsons to a current episode. There's more jokes in this modern day episode, Mm -hmm. but none of the jokes work except maybe two. Whereas a a show that has fewer actual number of jokes, but a more consistent (laughs) level of working jokes, I'm going to be drawn more towards that, even if there's dry spells in the episode. Mm -hmm. I'd rather something be funny than constantly like getting a constant onslaught of just bad and annoying jokes i i will say i do like more joke density that's why i tend to like the uh later mike episodes of comedy central a little bit more and even the later joel episodes where they were really picking up a pace but here the jokes are more obvious and they're a bit more lazy and that's an example of one like i i think he must be responding to some kind of joke that was going around at the time because it just feels like something that is more of a reference than a joke yeah uh, but uh, aside from from the episode itself, this movie <laughs> is bleak and unpleasant. And we were just talking about a monster killing himself because he had no place to go. <laughs> I would much rather watch that than this. I would love to have been a Gene Shalit type critic in the 1960s when this was released, just so I could write to the paper, Limp Leech lacks luster. Uh, I actually prefer this movie to the last one. Ooh. And I know because you said you were warning me that uh, Leech Woman would be even worse, but I kind of like the fact that in a strange way, it was exposing some injustices, like the people who are pointing out those those uh, injustices are themselves monsters. But the fact that the heroes are, there are no heroes, the, the lead guy who is basically a carbon copy of our last hero, except for he's dreadful, you know, like he has the same kind of unearned confidence and way of just like kind of bulldozing over everybody but with kind of a 50 sense of sophistication about him but this time they're they're emphasizing that there's there's something sinister about that and the fact that at one point uh i think it's mala points out how unjust it is that old women are treated so poorly Mm -hmm. like it's it has everything to do with men and it's it's just not a fair situation and the fact that they like point out that slavery exists i think this i think this is the first time i've ever heard slavery mentioned in one of these movies just off the uh, off the top of my head though if we're going to be like sympathetic to 
uh, Mala and June. Why would Dr. Paul be so hilarious? <laughs> <laughs> the first scene where they are bickering, I was like, I'm on this guy's side. He's funny. <laughs> Like, he is so mean that it's like watching a a sitcom. And I felt like I was watching something exceptionally brutal. For the first couple of minutes, I was like, if every scene is going to be like this, this is going to be a thrill ride. (laughs) Uh, And he is, (laughs) even though uh, uh, Mike and the bots uh, give him a a lashing for essentially tuning out noticeably during uh, his scenes when he's not talking, he's a much better actor than John Agar. And I would also say he's better than just about everybody in this movie. When he's talking and and essentially giving everybody a dressing down he's the only person i found captivating to watch i have to admit at first there seemed to be almost a who's afraid of virginia wolf kind of banter going on but june is just so obviously beaten down that it was hard to feel like you know there was a real sense of give and take going on but yeah i see where you're coming from but i just like the fact that he was just so nakedly transparent about like what his motives were and that she didn't clue in to that was uh, until it becomes too obvious for her to deny Hmm. i felt like uh... see this movie would be a lot better if like either june was made to be more sympathetic so that we saw her suffering before she's just kind of wandering into her husband's workplace demanding scotch (laughs) or or if she was cruel if she was just as cruel as him, which would certainly make her uh, murder spree later on uh, a bit more fun to watch. Like, I think they're going for the basic tenets of these universal monsters being tragic figures. I think they're trying to recapture that with her, but it just doesn't work. <laughs> like, oh, you, you lose about 10 years uh, off your face if you murder a guy. Okay, don't don't do that. Well, I think that they were trying to set that up because when the first ceremony happens where they find out how this whole de-aging process happens, she's the only one, June seems to be the only one who's horrified by the idea of killing somebody for the sake of looks. And that lasts five seconds. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's not well written, but I think the suggestion is that this is not something that in, you know, a just world she would naturally do, but she's been driven to it by... Uh, the fact that men only desire beauty. And they emphasize that, that as soon as she's beautiful, she has so much power and everyone around her is is instantly drawn in, including, uh, what's his name, Gravy? Yeah, Gravy. <laughs> <laughs> I believe his first name is Tub and his middle initial is O. Yeah, so, I mean, of course, it's, it's uh, the nightmare of the femme fatale and everything, but it seems to be, at least for a while, suggesting that she really had no choice you know her life had just become so so pointless and uh she was driven to such hate by her husband's betrayal that like this is just something that happened to her yeah and you know i I think it's kind of great and it's a missed opportunity that there the the surname for june is talbot uh similar to the wolfman uh, because I think her name should have been Hancock because she walks around with a ring that looks like a tiny dick <laughs> that she pierces dudes' necks with. <laughs> Come on, that pun was just laying on the ground. Nobody was going to pick it up. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's... This summer, get Hancock. <laughs> Leech Woman in theaters now. I mean, th- th- that I think exposes everything, right? The name, the-, the fact that it's called a Leech Woman, where... Really, this has nothing to do with leeches. Like, she doesn't suck blood, which would be the most obvious metaphor to make there. It's just that she leeches off of men like all women do, right? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, th- then again, you have Sally, who is like a uh, the closest thing this movie has to like an upstanding citizen. Yeah, until until they don't need her to be anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's like, now you get murdered. P.S. <laughs> woman pineal juice, no good. <laughs> What would have been great, and I know this would have been impossible for 1960, and especially of a movie of this small a budget, but it would have been great to show uh, June sucking Sally's neck and just having her head caving in like a rotten apple, because that's how we find out that the uh, Lady Pineal Juice, no good, because we get a cutaway and June looks at herself in the mirror and she's even older. I'm not sure how that works, but why not? Well, I guess if things were reversed, would that mean that men could only use the pineal glands of women to get younger? Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I guess so. We don't see any any men doing this. And I guess that's an interesting commentary of itself where it's like it doesn't matter if a man gets old. Yeah, exactly. So, Adam. Yes. Would you like to know something about leeches? No, this movie had nothing to do with leeches. Uh, all right. Well, uh, when they say leech woman, what they really mean is old woman. Yeah, this is an old crone movie. When you do see old women in Hollywood, they are usually complaining that they are old. <laughs> that's yeah, that's about it. I mean, the only I guess really different expression of that would be in the 19 I think it may have been 1970, so just 10 years after this, there's a movie called Sex Tet uh which starred oh, Mae West. Canadian lusty starlet. But because it was 1970, she was well into her 50s if not older. Mm-hmm. But everyone's still acting like it's like, hey, it's Mae West. Uh, and so she is a, a sexually active granny uh, who is getting married to a very young Timothy Dalton. But at the same time, didn't she produce and uh, write most of her movies? Yeah, I'm pretty sure she's the only person who would have greenlit sex dead. <laughs> <laughs> And certainly Hollywood isn't the only cultural creation that sidelines old women. I mean, through basically all of Western literature, old crones are either easily discarded or they're feared for their possible association with witchcraft. And, you know, the basic reading of this would be if you're living in a patriarchal society, you really don't have any use for uh, non-childbearing women. Well, not to mention like the, the beauty and sexual attraction angle, too. Like, the, these women are unattractive, therefore useless. Yeah, but uh, the argument is that women become unattractive once they hit menopause. Hmm. Oh, I thought it was strictly physical beauty that we were talking about. <laughs> if you're going for that theory, and it's a really essentialist kind of view about, you know, the patriarchy, and I don't know if I completely buy into it, but the argument is that the way women are valued has everything to do with their ability to bear children, because that's the only use that they have in a patriarchal universe. And so as soon as women lose that ability, they are useless. And so that's why men, old men, are not only considered dignified, but they can still be considered sex symbols well into middle age, whereas that is not available for women. Hmm. But then I would say, admittedly, men do not go through a menopause, which does really change things around a lot. But this would also be one of the reasons that I love the fact that the LGBT movement and queer theory has forced people to think about these things that we just take for granted, like this movie, like old women, what miserable lives they have because nobody wants them. And uh, for instance, I have a friend who's a lesbian and she loves old women, especially old French women, because (laughs) they have a dignity and they have a self-possession that you don't get when you're younger and that you can only get with time and wisdom. And I love the fact that, you know, that's a perspective that we can key into now because the visibility is there. And, you know, if you're not basing your value on what men think of you, then you don't have to be miserable. <laughs> I suppose that's true. Um, I, I, am, I am curious, though, just in regards to like, I mean, it, it's you end up in this kind of a weird situation if you were like a postmenopausal person or even just someone you know to to, i guess include men into it uh someone middle-aged and uh single you do have like like i i can't imagine what it's like to form relationships or romantic bonds at that age just because i like i mean everything is different and you're seen so differently too i think even among people your own age but i i don't know i have no experience there with older women and, rom- and romantic relationships, you mean? Not that old, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've at, at most dated a woman who's 10 years older than me, which is not much. I'm 35. I think in spite of the fact that we uh, see not just old women, but elderly people in general as being non-sexual beatings, you know? <laughs> non-sexual beatings? Sorry, non-sexual <laughs> beings. I only like my beating sexual. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, if you look at the STD rates in nursing homes, I think you'll be disabused of that idea. That's true. I was really surprised <laughs> to, to, to read that, but it reminded me of what uh, a great old British character actor, Tom Baker said, uh, where he's like, I, someone asked him how he's enjoying his retirement. He's like, all old people do is fuck, is what he says. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, so like they're trying to portray June as a monster. 
Mm -hmm. basically and i guess with this this kind of goes along with like the old crone myth and and uh, like the baba yaga i don't know how familiar you are with that Oh, yes. Yes. The very old crone who is also extremely powerful. She's like a founding witch, isn't she, in, in some ways? Well, it it, it varies because like I originally thought the Baba Yaga was Bulgarian, but it's kind of spread around all over Eastern Europe. Like it's it's a widespread myth. All I, all I really know <laughs> is that she flies around in a mortar. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that's cute. It's like, oh, they they had Mega Man, they had Mega Man villains all the way back then. It's interesting to think of an old woman as a monster, which is basically how they're they're setting it up here. Although she doesn't get to be a monster for very long. No, which is weird because it's like I think the basic the basic thing like if you if you refigured this movie if you reconfigured this movie and you made it so that June is a woman who is dying. And she finds this jagged blow pop ring and she has to kill people to live like a vampire. You might have something there, but the, the anti-aging angle just seems like it's just get f***ing old. Who cares? So Beth, mm -hmm. so June Talbot or the actress who played June Talbot is a year older than you. Hmm. That's what I figured. She looked like she was in her thirties. And then it's just a question of like bad lighting versus good lighting. So, how does that make you feel? Did you uh, did you identify with her as someone who is about your age? Yes, Beth. Now that your looks are fading, <laughs> did you want to get some of that sweet, sweet pineal juice? <laughs> yeah. Do I feel like an old lady? Oh, God, yes. All the time. I'm falling apart extremely quickly. But <laughs> at the same time, I feel... <sighs> I feel more and more that my self-esteem does not have to be tied to my appearance, mm. although it certainly is attached to how I feel sometimes. But I think that is one of the best things that I hope feminism can give to women going forward is a way to decouple their sense of self-worth from their appearance, which is just so disastrous and terrible. Beth, before we move on, I want to present you with a hypothetical. All right. Would you feel more comfortable uh, uh, doing as June does, but, but you only have to do this once a year. You will retain a mid-30s appearance. Hmm. So look exactly the same as you are now. Hmm. But you'd have to take out a, a, <laughs> a strap-on ring, your, your, your ring pop of death, <laughs> and puncture a dude. You'd have to lure them into a darkened alley and, and suck out their pineal juice. So either that or you could be immortal and youthful, but every year you'd have to cut off a chunk of your body, like say a toe at first and then two toes and then three toes and so on, <laughs> so that there'd be less of you to cover in DH. And by the time uh, it's over, you'll just be this youthful stump. <laughs> What's better? That's my hypothetical and Adam's hypothetical well, corner. Killing other people, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you never wanted to be one of Mombi's smiling heads? <laughs> I mean, other people are just an illusion, right? I'm sure yeah. I could convince myself of that. I suppose that's true. And you can, uh, yeah, well, you can just tell him, it's like, ah, I'm getting rid of bad people. <laughs> like that <laughs> small time crook the cops were so concerned about at the end of this movie. That's right. I mean, Dexter got a whole series out of it. Why can't I just be like, the, you know, this is helping people? I actually think that this is an interesting movie because unlike the last movie we watched, Revenge of the Creature, it seems to have some sense of what the monster is pissed off about. Yeah, and I, I guess part of the <laughs> the main part of that is that uh, Creature does not speak English. <laughs> no one is signing with him like in the shape of water. But we do get a sense of why June feels the way that she does. We just don't get really that much motivation other than, hey, this marriage sucks and she's a drunk. We don't know why, but whatever. We'll figure it out. Part of her monstrosity seems to be that she's sexually insatiable. <laughs> Is she? Yeah, I get a lot of the sense that what they're suggesting in their very 50s way although this is technically 1960, is that the reason she's so miserable is her She's not getting any of the peen from her husband anymore. Hey, that sweet Talbot peen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that she is being withheld. Uh, so you see this. It, it's, a, it's very interesting because you have this return of a myth about women that had gone away for a while in the modern era. So 
this is something I find very interesting. So in the, in the Middle Ages, in the early modern era, the myth was about women was they were the sexually insatiable ones. They were like the more kind of brutal, evil ones that were not as capable of being rational. And then the Victorian era, you have women being set up as basically angels. They're less animalistic. They don't have that connection to sex in quite the same way. And then we're having this kind of return where, where the suggestion is that part of the problem here is June is just insatiable. I, I think that if there was any element of sexuality in like the first half hour of the movie, that would be communicated better. Like if she was flirting with Garvey or whatever his name is. But she te- she's clingy, right? And that I think is supposed to be the code there. Is she t- she tends to cling on to men. She does that to her husband. She does that to Neil. Like she she's very, I guess, leechy. Maybe that's where it's coming from. But but if she if she, if she was just 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 hog wild for dawn <laughs> why doesn't she like a, a, a better version of this movie would have been implying as coquettishly as they would have to that she is sleeping with the men she is murdering also she would murder more than one guy <laughs> in the uh, in the city but she slept with garvey uh did she <laughs> yeah i to- totally gross you, you can always tell if sex is happening because there's a fade away <laughs> I, I thought they were just going to start knitting. <laughs> but at the same time, and, and even more interesting than her is Mala, who, as I said, like very interestingly, and, and this is what I'm like the monster articulating, like sh- she is the one who's like, you know, I'm old because I have this slave mark. Hey, remember slavery? However, like white people are off the hook because this was an Arab slave trade. Yes. But I kind of like how the movie just lets her get what she what she deserves like she totally cons this doctor into paying for her return trip to africa back to her tribe and then when he meets up with her she's like yeah i'm gonna kill you now and you know what you treat your wife pretty badly i'm gonna let her kill you that's true although the tribe does get blown up <laughs> yeah i wonder why they wanted to keep europeans away from their tribe <laughs> so miles play kind of backfires quite literally <laughs> although you get the sense that there's just mostly just property damage <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no collateral damage. I hope Mala made it through and she got to bang as many guys as she could before uh, before the end. Of all the characters in this movie, Mala, I think, is by far the most interesting and sympathetic. And I find that to be what makes this movie a lot easier to watch than the last one. Well, one, Dr. Paul is hilarious. How dare you? <laughs> 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 and I think one of the reasons why Mala, I think, is, is so interesting is just that the actress they chose for old Mala is so striking. Young Mala is not bad in her, like, 30 seconds of screen time, mm-hmm. but she, like, makes a huge impression. And uh, like, I think, like a lot of actors who are chosen to play old, like, she's she's older than she actually is. Like, she looks old, so she'll read as ancient by an audience. Like, I don't really think there's that much makeup on old Mala, certainly not compared to the amateurish makeup that's on June. Yeah, like she's the kind of old I kind of want to be. Hickory smoked. <laughs> Hickory smoked. Shame on you, Mike. Um, <laughs> you don't see that kind of aging anymore. Like that's an aging you get when you've been outside a lot. Like that's that's sun damage that she has, but there's a dignity to it that she she just has so much of a sense of possession. I think that she's actually kind of. Like she's beautiful, mm. and I I hope I have as interesting a face as that that I've earned that kind of aging when I am you know elderly. That's true. I mean, like, all right. Well, then I've got a new hypothetical. Mm. <laughs> all right. So you can have a face that interesting, but you've got to murder a man every year. <laughs> <laughs> I already said I'm fine with that. <laughs> or, or you can have a face that interesting right now. And you can switch back and forth whenever you want, but you got to start cutting off your toes. Can I start with my pinkies? I could probably fit into more shoes that way. Sure. Yeah, okay. I just got to say, like, that is actually one of the, like, weirder things about this movie is, like, the old age makeup that they eventually use on June, which basically looks like they just stuck a plastic bag to her face. I'm not quite sure how they, they did that, but it has a an old bag kind of quality to it which I suppose is where that comes from. Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, she has the posture of a young person. Hmm. And those two things together is very weird to see. Yeah, it's interesting. Although uh, I am also weird out because Mala kind of looks like a live action version of Ren from Ren and Stimpy. <laughs> She's got those big bug eyes. 
Why did you t- why did you put that in my head? Because <laughs> it'll never leave. Now, Beth, you can remove that image, but you're going to have to start with <laughs> one toe. Hey, everybody, it's time for the Shadow 13. It's time for the Shallow 13, 13 quick facts about the leech woman and this episode. Go, Adam, go. Our titular leech woman, Colleen Gray, is best known for co-starring with Sterling Hayden in Stanley Kubrick's The Killing in 1956 and Kiss of Death in 1947. For Misty's, however, she's remembered for this film and Phantom Planet, Rift in Season 9. According to IMDb, the Talbots hated each other on screen and off. The actors Colleen Gray and Philip Terry would continue bickering long after cameras stopped rolling. Speaking of happy marriages, Philip Terry was Joan Crawford's fourth husband. No comment. On the other hand, Kim Hamilton, the actor who played young Mala, spent the last few decades of her life dating and eventually marrying Werner Klemperer, the actor who played Colonel Klink on Hogan's Heroes, prominently referenced in the last episode we looked at, Revenge of the Creature. The Leech Woman is seen by some as the end of Universal's classic black and white horror cycle, which dated back to Lon Chaney senior thrillers of the 20s. Despite late-period successes like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Universal knew this style of horror was losing ground with audiences, and quickly cobbled Leech Woman together to act as the B-movie on a double feature with Hammer's Brides of Dracula. Even before plans to reboot the Universal Monsters as a dark cinematic universe fell apart with Tom Cruise's Mummy remake, there was no intention of bringing back lesser-tier Universal Monsters like the Leech Woman or the Thing That Couldn't Die, Rift in Season 8. The pineal gland lies deep in the center of the brain, and you'd need a much longer stabby ring to access its sweet, sweet juice through the neck. Because the function of the pineal gland is not completely understood, many have attributed mystical qualities to it. Descartes called it the principal seat of the soul, while some have theorized it can bring on hallucinogenic episodes. In reality, it seems to mostly be involved in the production of melatonin, a sleep hormone. Our old pal the kookaburra... (laughs) returns as its call is used for the African scenes here. Servo likens the bird song to the falsetto laugh from Wipeout, an iconic surf instrumental by a group called the Surfaris. Personally, I think it sounds more like the Crypt Keeper. (laughs) Shifty guide Garvey meets his end via deadly quicksand. Fun fact, quicksand is neither quick nor sand. For more information on this timely issue, we have a special bonus for our Patreon backers from It's Just a Show, Episode 12, Hercules Against the Moon Men. Access this and all our bonus bits on patreon.com slash it's just a show. Servo imitates Granny Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies throughout the episode. The grizzled granny was played by Irene Ryan when she was only in her 50s. Ryan was already a household name through her successful vaudeville act with her husband and their national radio show, Tim and Irene. Ryan gained acclaim in her final days for her performance in the Broadway show Pippin before dying of a stroke in 1973. In our first segment in Deep Ape, Bobo tries to keep Mike and the bots at bay with a zebra-patterned stool. It's the Doctari stool, Joel's final invention from Season 5, Episode 12, Mitchell. Crow is grateful that Leech Woman is better than Congo, a mid-budget 1995 jungle adventure tribute to B-movies of old based on a Michael Crichton novel. With a self-aware script and a fabulous cast made up of Laura Linney, Joe Don Baker, Delroy Lindo, Tim Curry, Ernie Hudson, and Bruce Campbell, it's way better than Leech Woman. And that's time. One thing we should talk about, though, and ask the question, we've, we've already asked who's afraid of the Leech Woman, but who is afraid of Virginia Woolf is a more pressing question, because that gets referenced a number of times throughout the series, and in particular, this episode. I'm going to give you that divorce, so you won't have to look at my face any longer. And don't forget, Nick and Honey are coming over tonight. <laughs> are you familiar with the play? I know of it. It's been a long time since I've watched it through. I saw the movie with uh, Elizabeth Taylor. And Richard Burton, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, tumultuous drinkers, romantically <laughs> yeah. linked. Yes, that on-screen chemistry had so many levels going on. Oh, my God. And it climaxed with that beautiful TV movie starring Lindsay Lohan, Liz and Dick, which I actually misread as Lizard Dick and tuned in based on that. <laughs> yeah, and actually, at the beginning, I was hoping maybe that was the kind of dynamic that we'd have going through was kind of a peppy but cruel back and forth between the couple. But as I said, that definitely is not what's going on here. We just have a cruel husband and a... A desperate wife. Yeah, we were talking about that at the beginning of the episode, and I was really hoping and would have found it a lot more interesting if June gave as good as she got, but just kind of took it and offered some fairly passive one-liners. But I guess that that makes her like the Burton character in the film version of the play, who is, you know, far more passive-aggressive. 
Yeah, but I think something that maybe they also share is rampant alcoholism. Well, yes, that's what's driving this connection, yes. <laughs> Besides just the, the peppy back and forth. What did you think of the alcoholism uh, and like what the motivations were behind it? Basically, like a marriage falling apart drove one of the members to drink, which is basically what is happening in the play as well. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, it's, it's kind of interesting because I think that attitudes changed regarding alcoholism and it changed kind of slowly and reverberated slowly, you know, culturally, because you often see drunks and and people with alcohol addiction uh, depicted in a kind of clownish way mm. you know throughout comedy which admittedly uh, comedy writers and stand-up comedians there is a uh, a huge wealth to draw from when it comes to alcoholism <laughs> but you do have people who play that up like stand-up comedian foster brooks who exaggerated uh, his state to be even more slurry uh, when he was on stage and performing at Friars Roasts and things like that. Like I think Virginia Woolf, I think that play was instrumental in kind of getting people to rethink that. Not to mention like in the, well, I believe, what is it, in the 1920s you see the uh, rise of AA? I'm, I'm not sure. Let me just double check that when AA actually started. <laughs> Sorry. That was my job, but I was doing something else. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. 1935. 1935. Okay, so post-prohibition. All right, so I, I part of, partially one of the reasons why you see, I think, attitudes change is the rise and success of Alcoholics Anonymous. But it's interesting you pointed out that there, there's an attitude change here because you're right in Virginia Woolf, there's a recognition that alcohol might be like, it, it is just a symptom of a deeper misery going on. Yeah. Whereas I think before alcoholism was just considered a personal failing a, a lot of times. And that's why it was, you know, often treated with a little bit uh, as a derogatory thing, as opposed to a tragedy. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, like, before I even knew what drunkenness was, uh, as a kid, I had a lot of access to old cartoons. Mm-hmm. And inevitably, you'd have somebody accidentally drinking, like, a big jug with triple X on it. Yep. And then that How Dry I Am instrumental would go <laughs> in the background. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Also, not so accidentally drinking it, because, like, all, all of the old-timey <laughs> cartoon characters... Loved booze. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you had the pink elephants in Dumbo, which is basically like a reference to extreme alcoholism as you start seeing pink elephants. Which, I, I mean, like, I'm, I'm glad I didn't find out about that because uh, there are strains uh, of alcoholism in my family. And so I I avoided a, like any drop of the stuff until I turned uh, 22. Whoa. Yeah, I, I totally abstained from it. I had well, I had a sip of beer once and I said, That's not bad. I don't want to drink the rest of this. And then I made my friend drink the pint that she bought for me <laughs> instead. I've been drinking since I was thirteen, just grew up in that kind of culture. Dang. You are yeah. gonna look like Mala. <laughs> <laughs> and and I can see that the attitude has changed there too. I came from a very heavy drinking kind of but very social drinking. Like it, what was really frowned upon was drinking alone. Yeah. That was the suggestion that there was something wrong with you. Well, Beth, I got a question for you. Is it considered drinking alone if you're drinking while recording alone in a room, but you're <laughs> recording a podcast and other people are technically there with you? Because I am halfway through this bottle of wine. Right now. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, no, I think that's perfectly fine. And secondly, enabler. <laughs> well, I don't drink nearly as much as I used to. And I think that's just times are changing. Might be an age thing as well. But I just feel like people just don't drink as much as they used to. And I think it's also worth mentioning that I, I think as of Frank's departure, so that would have been the season before, you no longer see Bill W listed among the special thanks of episodes of MST3K, which is weird. He would. He would have been totally fitting here, Bill W. being the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. My understanding is when Frank signed up for the show, he was a recovering alcoholic, Mm -hmm. and he uh, attributed a lot of that to AA. And so he uh, pushed really strongly to have that in the end of credits as a thank you. Yeah, there's a great, uh, if if anyone is interested, there is a great episode of very early on of the Mental Illness Happy Hour podcast with Frank talking about alcoholism. Really? Yeah, it's really good. And it's the, the first time I ever heard him talk about it. Um, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Definitely should plug that. We'll have it in the show notes. Yay! Hello, friends. It's Adam, your one true favorite co-host. Ah, that's the sound of me opening a can marked XXX. It contains booze or porn, I'm not sure which. 
If you're interested in more talk on alcohol as it relates to comedy, as well as personal stories of performing under the influence, check out You're Not Funny, Episode 7, Booze and Drugs. We name-checked this episode of It's Just a Show on it. You can find it at megaphonic.fm slash funny slash seven. My co-host is It's Just a Show producer Chris. We both have writing and performing backgrounds, his in music, mine in comedy. So we get together every two weeks, chat about our experiences, and we end each episode with a joke-off. It's not weird, I promise. We just tell each other jokes. And sometimes I just steal bits from Tales from the Crypt. It's Just a Show and You're Not Funny are productions of Megaphonic FM. Find these and our growing number of podcasts at megaphonic.fm. You'll be glad you did. Ah, that's good booze. Hey, it's a sci-fi episode. Let's talk about the sketches now. Okay, maybe we should try not to be so uh, negative when we talk about these sketches. Uh, Because obviously, there's a new dynamic. There's a new person that they're trying to figure out. There's a new situation. So they're still playing. And it's early on in the series. So let's see what they've done. I didn't mind the Union sketch. It got really dark really fast. Yeah, that's the one sketch I liked in this episode. (laughs) And what's interesting is that and maybe this is a sign that Best Brains is not quite as connected or invested in the show anymore, is that the Nanites, which is this brand new shiny thing to make comedy out of, and they get a great performance out of Mary Jo as Jody the Nanite. Yeah. <laughs> she is hilarious uh, in her brief, tragic appearance. Like, that is really funny and inventive. I feel like Mike Crow and Servo reacting to it is not funny and kind of breaks the sketch a little bit and then remarking later on it's like ah oh, you could just end all of this by pressing them down with your thumb he's like oh, i probably shouldn't that's that's it it's sort of it, it ends what is otherwise like i think a really great dark sketch it could have just ended with the screams of jody and then segueing into the uh spaghetti planet logo of mst3k like i i think that that sense of boredom is there and despite the freshness that we were feeling in the previous episode, it's like the, the rot is starting to set in. Like I, when I talk about these sketches, they're not coming from a place of personal anger, but it's hard not to say anything other than what were they thinking? Yeah. And I think you put your, your thumb on an, another thing that kind of, uh, I think is uh, an, an example of a broader problem is their reaction is so nihilistic like, shouldn't you care a bit? Like, you're supposed to be slightly good people, you know? And and that's something that happens in the Pineal sketch, too, where uh, Servo and Crow are, are trying to behead Mike so that they can get his Pineal gland. Ha ha ha, reference to the movie. But the idea of them being so indifferent to the life of Mike, I know that they're playing for laughs, but it's it's not... It, it doesn't... Ing- it doesn't ingratiate the characters to the audience i don't think like one of the things that was so so attractive about mystery science Theory 3000 in the comedy central era especially with joel is that they had an affection for each other yes you know that they they actually seemed to have a working relationship and they were in it together whereas it seems here like they just all hate each other i don't know like they're just three nasty people living together and and it's just an example of where the the just general attitude of the show went and it's not it's kind of it's kind of depressing to watch and like there's a way to make that work because i can think of one of the few times a group of hateful people who hate each other together uh works off the top of my head there is friends <laughs> no cuz i hate that show <laughs> um, <laughs> there is uh, a great a uh, Britcom called The Young Ones from the early 80s, which Trace Bull Yu cites as an influence in his writing. And there's also, of course, the long-running uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which is a great show about hateful, horrible people <laughs> who <laughs> yeah. damage each other. But the family dynamic in the SOL is so perfect and was so firmly established in the first five years of the show that when they try to change it or try to go to a darker place with those same characters, it reads as wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's weird because it's like you could have fixed the same sketch if you wanted to by just having Crow trying to trick Servo into getting his head chopped off. Right, because it wouldn't matter because he's a robot. Yes, and it would have been totally absurd that he wants the sweet pineal juice of a robot. 
how much do you think it is? Here's another working theory I have. Is this just... <laughs> you lose a toe. <laughs> uh, the disease of the 90s. Mm. You know, one of, one of the things about the 90s when I look back on it is if is it was a very sardonic age where the the nasty but clever person was kind of reified as the way you want to live in the world. When I think back about like even shows like Duckman, like that is a genuinely nasty person as funny as he is. Mm. And and the weird thing they did at the the series end where they suddenly try to turn him into a sympathetic person. Like for a while the 90s had a real thing for anti-heroes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Beth, Beth, you're misremembering Duckman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they 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 try to they they add sympathetic layers to him from the very beginning. Eh, they have she, he has a dead wife. He, yeah. he has a dead wife. He's he acts the way he does because he can't connect to people, which is like underlined throughout the show. And yes, he does kill two lovable sentient teddy bears every week. <laughs> uh, but and like, there's also that there's a, a really wonderful kind of like aching sadness to that cartoon, which is that people stick around this guy because they know if they leave, it would just fall apart completely. Like I, I think that's there from the beginning. Yeah, maybe. I don't know if it. If I know it, it, it starts coming out occasionally. But I think just his his attitude seems of a type back then, like the Chandler, basically. Mm. You know, the person who in real life you would never want to be friends with because he's he's nasty and unpleasant. That Chandler of the French Canadian Chandlers. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I don't i don't think it's the 90s i don't think it's like oh this is we're following a trend like i honestly think it's them struggling to bring an anarchic sense of fun to a show that is getting a bit long in the tooth so why did they keep going with riff tracks <laughs> <laughs> well there were no sketches there and i don't think the attitude changed that much i mean they had to redub a version of the room for riff tracks because they were really nasty about an actress's appearance. Mm-hmm. So they, they, that attitude didn't go away with riff tracks. So other reasons why I don't follow riff tracks. It's funny because I don't consider myself to be allergic to just nastiness for the sake of nastiness, but it just, and it's also just not very funny. Mm. I think maybe if they did it with more skill, it might be a little bit better, but I think with something like that, you have to have a very incisive wit and, MST3K has always been a little bit closer towards the goofy, mm. you know, and nasty goofy. That doesn't exist. But there's mirror universe goofy, of course. <laughs> nasty goofy. <laughs> he has a goatee. But like, I don't necessarily think because like, I do think of MST3K as having like a sharp wit and making sharp points all of the time. I just think that like what we're seeing and the reason why we're seeing it this way is that it's tired. And when people are kind of forming their identity, so to speak, as as like making jokes, the first thing they resort to is like jokes about violence. Like it's the easiest first thing that you do. It's like, oh, you, you know, create a drawing of something you saw on TV. You create a drawing of a famous character. You create a drawing of uh, someone in class and you blow them up. Like that's what it is. But it's like, I think we're seeing that creativity and that wit so dried out that that's what they're resorting to. I think that's what it is. Yeah, see, but where I'm coming from, they were at their strongest in season seven of the Comedy Central years. So how did they get, by that reasoning, so exhausted between the the two series? Was it the movie that wore them out? Uh, very much. I think the movie definitely played a big part of it because that was a huge headache for all concerned. But never underestimate the healing powers of Trace Beaulieu. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I think that about wraps up the leech she's right you need to fall off now chris do we have any questions from our listeners we sure do charlotte from portland asks if you were going to be a school teacher what grade level would you teach and why adam well i've given this a lot of thought beth Mm -hmm. because i think there'd be nothing better you can't get children while they're young you gotta get them when they're old so i would teach at, at the senior year of high school what I do is I get all those teenagers in a room and then I'd say, listen, I've got a hypothetical for you, <laughs> but it'll cost you a toe. The hypothetical, like knowing the hypothetical will cost them a toe. Yeah, the, the first taste is not free with me. You got to lose a toe first day of class instead of telling some dumb story about yourself and your name. Like, I'm going to remember that. What about you? I would have said like senior year as well, just because I've, I've taught 18 and 19 year olds in like the first year of university. 
and they're a great bunch. They're young, they're enthusiastic about the world, they're a little anxious, and their hormones have calmed down, and you know, they're trying to figure out as much as they can. And I never really wanted to be around little kids. Now that I have a little kid, and I see a lot of little kids, they're pretty cute. <laughs> and they don't require much. I think the least uh, likely age for me would be grades six to eight, also known as the smelly years. Hmm. I have a very sensitive nose. <laughs> If you've been affected by the issues on this show, if you're attracted to older women, or if you'd like to ask Beth and Adam anything, get in touch with us. Our website is itsjustashow.com, or we're on Twitter at itisjustashow. We'd love to hear from you. It's Just a Show is a podcast from Megaphonic FM. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. Thanks again to all our Patreon supporters. Support It's Just a Show and access some super fan bonus bits from this episode and from a bunch of our older episodes by going to itsjustashow.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash itsjustashow. And if you want to follow up on anything that was mentioned today on It's Just a Show, you'll find links in our show notes at itsjustashow.com slash episode slash 23. Now with the leech woman out of the way, Chris, what's next on our viewing docket? Well... Last episode, we watched a Universal Monster Picture, and this episode, we watched a Universal Monster Picture. So let's switch it up a bit with a Universal Monster Picture in Season 8, Episode 3, The Mole People. <sighs> Speaking of exhaustion. Yes. <laughs> there is a long stretch of dreary black and white Universal Pictures in Season 8 at the beginning. That's a little tough going that we're experiencing right now. And of all the times to bring back Jerry and Sylvia, I don't think they do it in this episode. I believe this is the episode that got me to stop watching MST3K back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> huh. It'll be interesting to see how this stacks up after the other two. Because you know what? I had mm -hmm. much fonder memories of these two episodes, and I barely remember Mole People. But I was disappointed because I thought both these episodes were quite bad upon rewatch. So maybe the Mole People's really great. Maybe. But until next time when we find out. Bye, everyone. And remember, beauty's only skin deep. So stick to injectables. And as always, think carefully about your answers, because you may lose a toe. All right, take it away, theme squad.